Hi, it's Contex here with a new series of videos about building and installing the original version of LFS version 1.0. So um, by the time you get to see this, um, Linux from scratch will be in its 25th year. Um, as you can see, it's published, first published on the 16th of December 1999, um, which is 24 years ago. Or nearly 24 years ago um, and I thought it'd be interesting to look back at Linux from scratch to see how it's evolved so it was originally written by Jared Beekmans uh, it's now maintained by um, more than one person larger group of people um, and indeed if you are interested in other older versions then you can read them at the web link uh, on the page uh, at the beginning of the well each each book there's some history as to how Jared Beekman's came about uh, writing the book uh, which you can read at your own ledger um, so that that is in every version but it's as I say it's nice to see how it all began and how we've got to where we are today with currently version 12 how it's evolved through the years. So the goals were, um, well, yeah, to build a working Linux from scratch 1.0 system. So not only just have a go at building it, but actually to get a working system. Otherwise, you know, what's the point really? Uh, but the main reason for myself was to gain an insight into the beginnings of Linux from scratch. We can always learn a lot about what we are today by looking back into history. Uh, I don't think that's any different with something like Linux from scratch. Um, and yeah, it's to learn how the procedure changed. So the original version, as you'll see, is quite raw around the edges. There's quite a few decisions you have to make, which you don't really have to make in the more modern versions of Linux from scratch. A lot of the um, potential pitfalls have been taken away. Um, in the modern versions which is good because it's an educational thing you don't want to be diverted from learning about something because of other little things you've got to concentrate on so it's not a bad thing but although it is rough around the edges the first version it's a very comprehensive document um <clears throat> it is all there it's very complete there's like i say just little bits you've got to fill in yourself So obviously we're doing something as old as Linux from scratch 1.0, which is, as I say, nearly 25 years old. It's in, in its 25th year. There are going to be problems. And I initially sat down and thought about whether it would be feasible to do this or, or even possible. Um, and the main problems that I came up with was that obviously we're going to need some old hardware because... Um, uh, running on new hardware may be issues with software and you know media how the media is obtained and all sorts of problems uh, but in, in having to use older hardware that in itself entails other problems for example older hardware probably hasn't got um, things like uh, USB or as I've got there on the screen 15 pin, pin G, VGA they wouldn't have um, display ports or HDMI ports or anything so it means the hardware has got to be older which either implies early flat panel displays or or the more common at the time um, cathode ray tube type monitors so that that was a problem is thinking like what else do I need apart from a computer that is of this age and also obviously a problem with that is that this old hardware is difficult to come by. Yeah, you can go on the uh, sort of marketplace websites and get stuff, but it's risky in itself. Um, you have to know what to get. Um, is it reliable? Will it work? And so on, as it's got down there. Due to its age or misuse even over time, um, the hardware may not be reliable, which is important or especially important compiling because... Uh, you don't want anything that overheats. You don't want anything that fails by getting a little stress, stress even if it's not overheating, um, because co compiling is a 
output there does stress the CPU and RAM, especially uh, in a system. So it's important that the old hardware is is reliable, is fit for purpose, even 25 years later, um, and that we've got all the attachments to enable us to use the, the box. So, for example, a keyboard that isn't USB connected, but a keyboard that's actually wired with a, a DIN plug of some sort. So because we've got problems sourcing the correct hardware, it also means we've got problems sourcing software because newer software um, will not work on old hardware and vice versa. So older software won't drive new hardware, which also implies that we need older hardware. So because we need to use old hardware, it does mean that we need to use older software um, older software also may be difficult to come by. Well, in the days of the internet now, it's quite easy to get hold of older software, especially uh, the open source type software such as Linux. Um, one thing to bear in mind, though, although it shouldn't really cause you an issue, um, especially uh, in what I'm going to be doing, which is just building it, not going to use it in anger. Um, but yeah, security issues. What you will find, and it's a problem I have to overcome myself, is that the older software won't be able to communicate with more modern computers because of uh, things like Telnet are deprecated now. Um, so invariably, invariably, if you want to connect to a modern computer through a remote session, it needs some sort of secure connection like OpenSSL via or sorry, OpenSSH via OpenSSL. Um, now that doesn't exist on the older versions or the older distributions of Linux, so that's an issue. Um, there's also things like connecting to the internet, uh, web pages, almost all web pages need a secure connection now using HTTPS protocol. Again, that didn't exist, so we can't just boot up an old distribution go on the internet and download the software and so on. There's all, there's all these issues to think about. Um, so that that's the problems that I needed to think about is like to ha how to get this configured in a usable way um, to be able to complete the uh, objectives of this project. Um, there's also actually problems with the build instructions themselves, not because of inherent problems with the instructions but because we're building this uh, 24 years later so one of the first problems is unlike as it says there, unlike the modern lfs instructions there are no exact software requirements to the lfs 1.0 host system so there's nothing in the book saying you need bin utils version x you need gcc version y and glibc version z for example um, it's just assumed that you're using a, a recent version or recent at the time version of Linux to build the um, Linux from scratch 1.0 system with. Similarly, there's no specific target versions required. So it doesn't say to build Linux from scratch, you need uh, to download glibc version 2. whatever or GCC uh, 13 dot whatever it's just assumed again that you'll be using the latest version at the time there's no specific versions apart from glibc and two gccs that get built everything else is just you know get orc get make get patch etc there's no no version information at all so i, I could see that 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 was going to be a problem as well so the solutions to the hardware, all of these problems here, obviously I needed a piece of hardware that would be appropriate for the time. Now around 1999 when Linux from Scratch was first released, I believe the most recent hardware was a Pentium 2. Uh, I'm not quite sure if Pentium 3s have been released at that time. They may, may just have been appearing, I'm not sure now. Um, I haven't got access to PCs, uh, Pentium 2 or Pentium 3 PCs. So 
uh, the the latest machines I've got is, as you can see, a Pentium 233MMX and a Pentium Pro. Well, a Pentium Pro I use as a server, and I actually use it as, to um, assist in building uh, Linux from scratch one, which you'll see how I use it uh, later on. So I decided to use a Pentium 233MMX with 64 megabytes of RAM. Um, 80 gigabytes is probably not contemporary. That's probably a few years on from 1999. Um, but Linux is able to handle a disk that size. The only problem that you might come across is the bootloader. Um, generally, bootloaders at the time could only see the first um, 1,024 cylinders on a disk. So the only caveat is that you have to ensure that the bootloader loads the um, kernel from a partition that's within the um, that that limit within within the first thousand cylinders or so um, of the disk. But apart from that, there's, there's no issue with using uh, such a huge disk. Again, I can't quite remember what would have been standard at the time, but I imagine something like a gigabyte would have been probably around about the standard size um, for a disk, maybe possibly larger but 80 gigabyte um, I'm sure that that would have been a few years to come at the time the reason I chose such a huge disk was just to create several partitions as I had the idea that maybe um, you know I could be installing other versions of Linux from scratch uh, alongside this but yeah I haven't decided whether that's going to be worth doing or not yet so um, in the end uh, the size of disk that I actually use or the amount of space that I actually use is probably about um, probably no more than four gigabytes, I guess. Um, but yeah, any, anything contemporary or if you haven't got disks that would uh, work with an old machine, then maybe a couple of say one gigabyte disks would be enough um, to, to do this. Um, also, network connectivity. Reading through the instructions of Linux from scratch, it seems to me that it's assumed that you'll be typing all the commands in at the terminal, reading from the book. So you print out the book, you'll be reading from the book and typing them in. Um, and while when I first started building Linux from scratch, which was around version 4 or so, I did do that because I wasn't aware of being able to do it remotely or um, even how how it would have been done if I had have known. Um, it is error prone. Um, obviously, if you make one mistake, then it could affect the rest of the build. And you know, generally, you have to start from scratch unless you can definitely track down where you made the mistake. So, one of the prerequisites I put upon myself was that at all times I would try and do the build remotely. Um, just so that I could copy and paste commands from the book into a terminal that was connected to the um, Pentium, to the Linux from scratch one machine. Now, as you'll see, um, there is a graphical environment that we could use, but again, once we get into the Linux from scratch one environment, uh, it's the same as a modern environment. You're going to lose all the libraries and the capability of building within a a graphical environment so building from a remote computer into the target computer is by far the easiest and I reckon probably about 90 to 95 percent of the commands I put in are actually over remote remote terminal there are a few as I remember that I have to actually do on the terminal um, but yeah most of it is remotely so that that helps prevent any typing errors or missing bits out well hopefully prevents missing bits out. It's still possible to miss bits out by doing things remotely, but uh, it just alleviates that problem. So you can see though those specs, apart from the disk, um, they're from about 1997. The Pentium 233MX was released sometime in 1997. And I think the computer I'm on, uh, which you'll see later on, is was released around 97, 98 or so. So it's contemporary you know, near enough to Linux from scratch 1.0. It's only a year or two older, which is good. I didn't want anything newer because obviously that would break the uh, chronology of everything. Um, obviously, I couldn't have been on, say, a Pentium 4 
um, and building something in 1999 because the Pentium 4 wasn't around at the time. Uh, and let's say the Pentium 233 is the machine that I have to hand that fits everything. So that's the hardware sorted out. I've got terminals and mice and keyboard that fitted it. Um, and let's say the networking in it, that, that works fine as well. Software solutions. So again, because we've got problems with an old machine, we can't just lump on a modern um, version of Linux because it's unlikely to work. It's probably unlikely even to fit if given um, a small disk. So what I did, I, I found the first version of or first distribution of Linux that I actually used outside of professional environment, which was SUS Linux 6.1. This was actually released on the 7th of April 1999. So by pure chance, that kind of fits in with the era as well. Um, so I'm lucky to to have that. Um, it's only, you know, what, six, eight months are, uh, prior to Linux from scratch 1.0 being published. So it's around the right area, around the right time. The versions of the packages are roughly in the right um, territory as well in terms of versions. Um, so it all, all nicely fitted in for me. Um, as you can see, SUS Linux 6.1, it comes with uh, Linux kernel 2.2.7. Uh, you might see other versions somewhere, even on the SUSE page. If you type in SUSE Linux 6.1, you'll see an archive page on the actual SUSE website. And it says that I think the Linux version is 2.26. Well, that's actually incorrect because I've, I've double checked. And it is actually 2.27. Uh, sorry, 2.2.7 uh, on the command prompt when you do uname. So whether that's a preliminary version or whether it's a typo, I don't know. Uh, and usually it uses a compiler that was around for a short period of time called EGCS. I can't remember what the E stands for, but it was a GNU compile or a compiler system, I think it was. And it was actually a fork of GCC at the time. I can't remember the full history uh, of why it was forked, but EGCS eventually became uh, what... GCC is now. So originally there was GCC2, for example. EGCS was forked from that. And then what was GCC became what EGC, EGCS was. So the modern GCC is related to EGCS and that itself is related to GCC. The modern GCC is not directly related to the older versions of GCC. Um, you can probably read about that on the internet, I imagine, um, some of the history around that. And the glibc version it uses is 2.0.7 pre-6, which incidentally is what Linux from scratch 1.0 uses. So that's quite handy that it's the same glibc library. Um, and incidentally, it does use KDE 1.1. I believe, as I remember, on the SUS packages, um, which we will see. Um, GNOME was still experimental. It, is, it has got a copy of GNOME, so I, I didn't know this, but it seems that KDE is older than GNOME. Um, I thought it was the other way around. I always thought that GNOME was older than KDE, but it seems that KDE is older. Um, so I will be getting uh, a graphical environment up just to show you out of pure interest, but I won't actually be using it for anything. It will purely be out of curiosity. So that's the uh, host system, basically, and what it's capable of. And finally, the solutions I came up with for the Linux software requirements. Um, well, as you've seen, we're using a recent contemporary host to the time, that is, to December 1999. So SUSE 6.1 fairly contemporary. Uh, I'm not actually sure when... SUSE 6.2 came out, whether that came out after or before. But as I say, SUSE 6.1 is what I had to hand. And it, it is perfectly fine to build Linux from scratch 1.0 anyway. Then there's what, what target versions are required. Well, I initially thought, well, I might as well go with the versions of the source software that come with 6.1. Um, then I saw in very early on in the Linux from scratch 
1.0 book, it says to use the latest version unless mentioned otherwise. So I actually found as I went through that roughly a third, between a third and half of the packages are just source packages, source code that I've taken from the SUS 6.1 disks. Uh, and all the rest I've ferreted around the internet for newer versions. And generally they're newer versions that I've managed to find. Occasionally I've not been sure about the source, so I've just stuck with the older version um, that came with Sue. So you may, if you do start searching around yourself, find newer versions uh, than the ones I've used. Um, there's the odd package like that, maybe one or two packages. Um, but as I say, I wasn't really sure about the source uh, of those, you know, the, the actual website where I'd found these older versions, whether they were appropriate, whether they were the genuine original version, or, you know, there's some discrepancies I wasn't really happy about. Um, so they're all versions that have been released uh, as close to the release date of Linux from Scratch 1.0, which was 16th of December 1999, um, as close to that but before that. There's maybe one exception to that that I've made where the package was actually released on that day. Um, I can't remember which package that was, but it's possibly an exception. exception. You could argue it was released in the morning and uh, Linux from Scratch was released in the evening. So... Uh, maybe I've broken the rules a little bit there, possibly, but it was that or a, a version that was a few years older, so I decided to take a chance and, you know, it paid off. It, it didn't break anything. Um, and as you've seen already, the only exception is that there are specific versions mentioned in the book for glibc 2.0.7 pre-6, and as I've already mentioned, that happens to be the exactly same version that uh, SUS 6.1 comes with. Likewise, SUS also comes with GCC 2.95.2. Um, and I can't remember the GCC 2.7 version or, or that it comes with, if it does at all, but I, I'm pretty sure I downloaded these anyway. Uh, actually, yes, it might not be. It might be the GCC 2.7 SUS come with, but not 2.95. Uh, and as it says here, it contains all the sources anyway to build Linux from scratch 1.0. But because it says use the latest version, um, that's why I went ferreting around for um, newer versions for all the packages. Some some packages had, hadn't been updated in several years. So um, I do remember that from when I used to build the uh, older versions of Linux from scratch, like versions 4 and 5. Um, used to see that some packages never got updated for whatever reason for several years at a time. Um, if you do go around searching for newer sources yourself, if you think you can find some newer ones, just bear in mind it does take a bit of time. I reckon I probably spent about a third to maybe nearly a half the time when I was trying this out, trying to look for newer versions, um, you know, reliable places to get the newer versions of the packages. Uh, if you do have problems, um, I was concerned that some of these older versions could suddenly disappear from the internet, such as the volatile nature of the internet. So what I'm planning on doing is to upload all the packages um, to somewhere or other, which I haven't decided yet, um, and then make the link available so that you can just download all the packages for Linux from scratch 1.0 without having to worry about going looking for anything. Um, but obviously you'll need to download um, a host system that's appropriate for the time. Um, I think Red Hat's probably around 5.1, maybe 5.2 is roughly around. I, I remember doing a course in the middle of 1999 on, um, uh, well, Unix course it was actually, because it was on Solaris, a Solaris machine, around the middle of 1999. Um, and they sent us away with a, a copy of Red Hat, I think it was. Pretty sure it was Red Hat version 5, and I can't remember the suffix. It was you know, 5.0, 5.1, 5.2. So uh, around that version, if you look into that, if you want to use Red Hat. Um, as I say, there may be a slightly newer version of SUS that's before the end of 1990, 1999. I, I, I didn't really look into that because I had this version uh, to hand. 
Um, Slackware would be another one around at the time, and probably Debian as well. Um, but but so I don't know what versions they would be. What we'll be showing you is where you can actually get SUSE 6.1 um, to download and to use that, and I'll be showing the installation of that as well, just to you know, get everything going. So that's uh, basically how I sort of um, try to work this out in my head, whether it's possible or not, try to work out what the problems were, and then obviously, as you've seen, to work out what solutions there would be. The other problem I had, which I haven't got uh, any information on slides for, was how to get the remote access, as I say, given that the um, older distributions didn't have, didn't have open SSH, um, how to download the packages and get them on the machine um, and so on. But I'll expand on that a little bit more in the next video where I go on to install SUSE 6.1.